Now on to this week's Flashpoints with CBS News National Security Analyst Juan Zarate, who takes us around the globe highlighting those important stories we might miss. Juan, one story we wouldn't, couldn't have missed was uh, Karzai's visit to Washington. Let's talk about that first. That's right, John. This was a face-saving, fence-mending trip to soothe the, the phrase in the, in the relationship between Washington and Kabul. I think they did that. I think uh, it was very important. The administration rolled out the red carpet for Karzai and a number of his ministers. He spent time with President Obama, dinner with Vice President Biden, several meetings with uh, Secretary Clinton, walks uh, to talk about the diplomatic engagement. But importantly, there was substance at play here. From the U.S. perspective, obviously dealing with good governance and corruption, talking about those things quietly, uh, talking about Kandahar, uh, pushing back on the Taliban's influence in Kandahar and the, the operations that are likely to come this summer, as well as talking about reconciliation. How do you deal with this very difficult issue of trying to politically reconcile? And so from a U.S. perspective, there was a lot of substance to get to, but the first part was to make sure that the relationship actually is not fraying and is strong for the future. Now, why, why is that important? Because there was a period where administration officials on the record and, and particularly off the record were beating up on President Karzai. Why does that have to be fixed? Well, the beating up happened uh, perhaps a little too much. There was a, a lot of it being done by different parts of the government. Uh, it was being done publicly in ways that I think at the end of the day started to hurt Karzai's credibility, his own sense of uh, what the friendship was about. We saw the effects of it. He even uh, gave the hyperbolic statement of perhaps wanting to join the Taliban in, in response to this. A little bit uh, ridiculous and a little bit of a fringe statement, but it did reflect, I think, uh, some tension that was starting to emerge because of the, the deep and public criticism. Part of this is personal, too. There's been a lot of criticism of Karzai's brother, his role in Kandahar, mm -hmm. whether or not he's a corrupt official, uh, and that goes to the heart of some of the concerns that the Obama administration has had. Okay, so now from a very new ally and perhaps shaky ally to our oldest ally, let's talk about the new prime minister in Great Britain. Well, you have odd bedfellows in this coalition government the, with the conservatives, uh, which have traditionally been uh, U.S. allies, very much westward focused in terms of their transatlantic uh, relationship, uh, matching up with the liberal Dem Democrats, uh, led by Nick Clegg, who during the campaign uh, said openly that he did not think there was a special relationship with the U.S., which is a buzzword in diplomatic circles, is the, sort of the, the bedrock of the relationship between the U.S. and the U.K., um, and so one question has been, what does the foreign policy uh, amidst this coalition, this odd coalition, look like? I think for the most part we're going to see stability in that foreign uh, relationship, in part because you obviously have the prime minister uh, who is uh, from the conservative party, the defense minister, the foreign minister, the chancellor of the exchequer, all the key uh, foreign policy uh, makers are from the conservative party. And, and stability means what with respect to what hot button issues? Iran, uh, the war against global terror in Afghanistan, where will it be sort of most important to have stability with Great Britain? I think the three hot button issues are Afghanistan and the, the status with NATO and and whether or not we're successful, we stay the course there. Uh, Iran, uh, what happens ultimately with Iran? Can we uh, get not only the UK, but the rest of the international community on board with tough sanctions and perhaps even more if need be in the future? Uh, and then finally, the general status of relations in Europe uh, right. with all of the crisis going on in Europe, uh, whether or not the UK will be a stalwart part of not just a, a, a European order, but also a relationship with the U.S. That, that makes a difference to our interests. Okay, and this third topic, let's move to the shooting of this Thai general. This was a, a general known as Commander Red. He was a renegade general who was helping the protesters who've now been protesting for over a month uh, in the heart of Bangkok. They've actually set up uh, different encampments uh, in parts of, of Bangkok, and this has been going on. It's something that's been festering. We've been watching it. Uh, it's been on the cutting list in terms of the flashpoints topics. But uh, importantly, uh, there have been uh, the potential breakthroughs for a negotiated settlement. Uh, the current prime minister had offered some elections which seemed to placate the demonstrators, but then the demonstrators pulled back. Uh, what this assassination does though, and it was an assassination uh, attempt or a shooting during an interview with a New York Times reporter, quite dramatic. Yeah. Uh, what it does is it fuels the demonstrations again. You have, have now more people joining the demonstrations, more tension with the government as to what happens next. Uh, and there isn't really a safe way out of this, uh, this problem. I think you're going to see further tensions, and you saw it overnight, more tensions on the streets of Bangkok. And obviously this isn't good for Bangkok, but how does it have, what's its more global implications of, of unrest there? 
Well, uh, Thailand and Bangkok uh, have always been seen as stable parts of a Southeast Asian order in, in some ways. And, um, you know, the demonstrations haven't spilled out in such a way that it's created a sense of regional instability. But I think people in the region, in particular the, the economic uh, watchers, are watching very carefully how this is impacting Thailand's long-term reputation as a place for stable uh, investment and stability. You know, a lot of the five-star hotels that are affected by this have been shutting down. A lot of foreign visitors have been leaving. And so for Thailand itself and for the economic development in the region, uh, and Bangkok's often been a, a gateway to other countries like right. Vietnam, et cetera, uh, it could have a longer lasting impact, but we'll see. Okay, last topic then is uh, Al-Qaeda in Iran. Uh, AP reported this week that uh, Iran is easing its grip on Al-Qaeda leadership uh, in Iran. Uh, folks often forget that uh, uh, core portion of the Shura Council, the senior leadership from Al-Qaeda Corps, actually is in Iran and has been in Iranian custody since 2003. Folks like Saif al uh, uh, um, uh, Abu Ghaith, uh, the spokesman, uh, al Maratini, the spiritual advisor to bin Laden, all have been in Iran. Uh, and an interesting question folks like I had to worry about when we're in the administration and folks that are, are watching this carefully have to worry about is, what is the relationship between Al-Qaeda and Iran? Fundamentally, they don't like each other. They are the extremes on the Sunni side from the Al-Qaeda types and extremes on the Shia side, and they don't like each other. Uh, but there have been often questions as to whether or not they're making deals with each other uh, in opposition to the great Satan, the far enemy, uh, as they often call the United States. And how much is there then a connection between the far enemy, which is trying to uh, impose tougher sanctions on Iran, and this loosening? Even, even the, given the fact that they're, you know, historical enemies. But is there any relationship between uh, an increased U.S. sanctions and this loosening on al-Qaeda? Well, there may be, because Iran is trying to read the tea leaves. Uh, they're trying to figure out, uh, you know, is there potential military action coming? What are the tools that Iran has to stave that off or even to deter it? Uh, and so folks have often argued, uh, and I've often said, that uh, Iran would use these senior leaders as uh, chips, chips with the United States, potentially chips with Al-Qaeda as they deal with Al-Qaeda attacks against Shia around the world, including in Iraq. Right. And so it's a complicated relationship. And no doubt Al-Qaeda leadership, which is now reeling uh, from being decimated in Pakistan and would be very happy to have some of these key leaders back, um, and Iran trying to read the tea leaves of international pressure, they are no doubt triangulating <laughs> here. And so this report is an interesting one because it gets at that relationship. And it's one that's very murky and hard for the United States to read.